I'm Roslyn Carita, and today we are at Collinsville, historic Collinsville, and we're going to show you some real history that you can find right here in Clarksville, south side to be exact. We're on Weekly Road, and we are standing in front of a building that was built in 1842. This is a smokehouse, and it has a great story, so stay with us. We're at historic Collinsville. Will you become a guardian angel? The Humane Society has been saving lives and helping families since 1968. We are an independently operated nonprofit organization and the strength of our programs rely solely on donations and grants. Will you become a guardian angel? Your donation will allow us to save animals from the local county shelter as well as provide low cost spay, neuter vouchers and more. All of our programs are geared toward providing families with options that prevent them from surrendering personal or found pets which might otherwise be euthanized at a shelter. Please be a guardian angel today. Joanne, here we are, and I know you told me that this was something that you actually, I mean, you know a lot about this. Was this brought here to this property? Yes, uh, you're familiar with the Customs House Museum. Of right. course, you were on the board there and instrumental in its uh, beginning when it was the Clarks Montgomery County Historical That's Museum. Right. Long time ago. Now, in the basement of that museum is a log house, and it was built by the fellow who built this house, or this smokehouse, Barnabas Powers, and it was in Palmyra, Tennessee, not too far out of Clarksville. So it was built in 1842, and people were so practical then. Barnabas Powers was a real artisan. Uh, we'll go inside in a minute, but right now, in order to excite the children, I'll ask Rosalind to hold up this tin can. Okay. We ask everyone, why was the ceiling filled with tin cans when we acquired this? Well, I don't know, they'll say. Well. What holds, the meat is, is hung from the bottom of the wire. Okay, so the meat would be yeah, hanging Yeah, the down meat here. is, is uh, hung and it's smoked in the smokehouse. But you know, rodents were a problem then, just like they are now. And the mice or the rats would hop from the ceiling down on the tin can and fall off. Ah, that so they couldn't get down to the meat. Couldn't get to the meat, that's okay. right. Okay, just so. like the way they used to do on boats, where they would put some kind of a, an obstacle so the rats couldn't run into, get on the boat. Absolutely. Same concept. So they Same were coming. Concept. I love it. So there's all kinds of yes. these hanging in Yes, here. we'll go in. And all right. Before we do, uh, the left side of this building was reserved for the ladies. And the ladies had, they would wash their clothes. They had three large black kittles on the right-hand side. And look at the nice overhang the men built them so they wouldn't get wet. Okay, and so they would stand in here. Well, they would go inside oh, and they'd be wash inside. their clothes. Okay. But uh, they were somewhat protected by the overhang. Okay, so this was the wash house and the smoke house. Wash house and smoke house. And I see a very large kettle there. Yes, and well, a scalding tub. Oh, and you told me that this scalding tub, which is laying upside down, mm -hmm. uh, was Joanne's wedding anniversary present. Uh -huh. I think it was the 25th, <laughs> thereabouts. It has a metal bottom and a metal side, and after the hog was slaughtered, it would be placed in this, and scalding water would scald it, and then you would take the hide off. Well, not the hide, but the hair. Okay. And you would then uh, prepare your meat for taking it to the smokehouse to salt it down, because if you go to Kroger's today and you leave a roast outside, it will ruin. By salting it, the salt took the moisture out of the meat and allowed it to be preserved, and then it would be hung, it would be hung up and smoked with hickory smoke, preferably. And you know, I, th I think that today, I know when you teach the kids, they have no concept about a time before refrigeration. So the smokehouse really was the only way that people had to preserve a quantity of meat That's right. that would get them through the winter and their families That's and right. extended families. Critical, critical. And the children today, they associate beef jerky because it right. isn't refrigerated. Right. And then you can explain, well, you know, what that happens next. There's a next. similarity. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's go inside this building. So this is the, the real important piece of a smokehouse. 
Yes, because without food, we wouldn't survive. And because of this particular type of building and what it did, our ancestors were able to survive and to have food to eat, to have meat at least. This was a tree. It was a tulip poplar tree. And according to our forester, there were 350 rings. So it was 350 years old when it was cut in 1842. So let me just pause right there. Okay, the tulip tree is, we know, the Tennessee state tree. That's right. And this, I mean, it took me a minute to grasp. This is a huge box. This is a tree. So they cut the tree and hollowed it out, much like you would a canoe. Yes, they're just like it. This is huge. And the texture of this now, we wouldn't think this is a tree. This looks like it's stucco. It's like velvet. That's what the salt has done. And you see it's filled with salt and the meat would be covered with salt and would be left, oh, 28 to 30 days. And then it would be taken out, dusted off, and you would hang it up and smoke it. And, you know, this is the piece that I don't think people think of. You know, we sort of have a vision of the time of year when they kill the hogs and they, get, they prepare them. But you think of them as hanging. I never have visioned having all these hams or the hogs. Shoulders. Yeah, mm -hmm. in, inside of this. So the, how much salt, was, were they totally covered up? Well, yes, totally have to be covered up in order to pull the moisture out okay. and to preserve them. You see, salt is the preservative. It's the great preservative. And after you leave it in there, and of course the weather determines a lot on after you start smoking the meat. If it's a real moist, uh, damp winter, the meat takes the smoke. That's to give it a good flavor. Okay. It's already preserved. And this obviously looked like they had to have it sealed up real carefully. You would put this on it because uh, the critters kind of animal, like it. Plus we, bears yeah. or anything. Well, our resident groundhog over here, <laughs> you know. We, I see that we, little hole. We just have to preserve it. <laughs> and so the timbers, other than this, uh, these are all timbers that were cut in Clarksville and moved here. You got help moving this whole thing. Carlos Lewis moved it intact. And Carlos Lewis has done a tremendous amount of work moving homes as well as historical. Yes. But that's incredible that he moved this intact. He moved most of these buildings intact. Oh. He moved the eight, this uh, double pin dog trot house intact, mm -hmm. one pin at a time. Uh -huh. Incredible. So now the other piece of this over here. Um, it's just storage for your different things that you need. Okay, and most of this was involved somehow in the smoking process. Yes. But this room was totally smoke room, and you were able to seal it up so that animals couldn't get in. Everything was done with wagon, of course, back then. The animals were hauled with wagons. They're so practical that this centerpiece comes, it slides up and comes out, so the wagon, the entire oh, wagon, could be backed in here. This whole piece, uh -huh. like a double just, garage yeah, door. Yeah, you just pull it down and it comes out. How interesting, because this mechanism, you know, we uh -huh. think of that as being something real complicated, but they figured out how to do it in a way to move. Uh -huh. How and interesting. And look at, the, look at the hinges. Look at the wooden hinges. Ah, these, this is incredible that these are the hinges. Uh-huh. I mean, that really is, as you say, And he practical. used to uh, take his pe pencil. You see all of these markings? He has marked weight, I assume, and he's, he, here's a division. He was adding oh. and subtracting and dividing. Uh, doing his math, doing on, the, his math. on the door. Uh-huh. Oh. Well, this is the smokehouse, and I know that you had a couple of other houses that are let's right go, on the premises. Yes, let's go to the loom house. Okay. So this is the loom house. Yes, most established homesteads in the 1800s had a separate building called the Loom House where some older member of the family, you see there were no nursing homes, you took care of your own until mm -hmm. they passed. So everyone back then, all the ladies knew how to spin and weave. So here they had their own house, their own little building, and we're in the process of warping up this oak loom. And when you say warping it up, what, that sounds like a, a term, a, a special looming term. If you can feel the shirt that you have on and imagine what it took to make that shirt in the 1800s before uh, mechanization, it would just absolutely blow your mind. This is how fabric was made. You would spin the thread, 
you would take the back beam and wind a warp. You'd wind the warp on these pegs here. We have ah, a little okay. beginning warp started. And then you would take it to the back beam and wind it on, but you have to be very careful to keep the, the threads in place. Then you would bring it forward. And these are heddles. We have a two harness loom, <laughs> harness number one, harness number two. Each thread has to be pulled through the eye of this of each heddle. So it's like it's threaded. Through. Yes, we thread <laughs> one, two, one, two, which is a very simple weave. And once this is threaded, then we have to go through the reed. And then we pull and this it is to the, the reed. This is the reed. Then and we those are it. tiny. You had to push it through that? Yes, we have oh. a little uh, in instrument that okay, helps us pull. pull. Okay. So last Saturday, we were able, my friend Darlene Cochran and I were able to get this to this point. And now the next step is to come through the heddles, through the reed, and tie it on. And then we're able to begin weaving, which is a crossing of the threads. And when you take a shuttle, which carries another piece of thread back and forth, then you are crossing the threads and you have fabric. What an incredible undertaking. What an incredible undertaking. Oh and we have gosh. all of the well-equipped things that a loom house would have. We have a, wind, we have a winder here. Okay. This winds from the spinning wheel. Okay. And this is so another. So first you spin. First you well, spin. Well, first you shear. Um, shear the shear. You, okay. you card the wool. Card the wool. Or cotton or flax. Right. And then you have it, you have to make. You from spin it. this, you have to make it to a thread. thread. And which, that's done with spinning. Which we'll do in the 1840s. We'll show you how to spin the thread. And then you wind it on a winder. Okay. And then you go from there to the war warping, to winding the warp. And you have to have a cross. Here's oh, your cross. Okay, now I'm seeing the fabric. I, I didn't really the see The thread. It. Uh -huh. So you have to have it in a certain... Um, you have to have it in a certain order. Okay. Can you imagine dealing with that many threads? without chaos if you didn't have it in a okay, given so order. Okay, this is the, what you refer to as the warping. This is the warping. Okay, and then from warping it goes to this stage over here. Yes, which is a very time-consuming stage. Oh my gosh! Stage, actually. Oh! Everything was time-consuming. That's why they had such few clothes. And this is an interesting piece right here. Those of you who like your linen suits, your linen skirts that w wrinkle so bad. <laughs> uh, the flax was grown. It was placed in a ditch to rent and it would become soft and then you would have to break the husk. And this oh. is a flax breaker. And after you broke the husk of the flax, then you would take the hatchel. This is a very rare hatchel. Well, I'm not sure I can get it open. But anyway, you would comb the flax and then you would spin it. So this, yeah, here, here we, we go. go. Oh my you goodness! You see how sharp yes. that is and dangerous. Yes. But it took that to to comb the rough husk of the flax, which then makes linen. Oh. After you spin it and weave it and how incredible! Sew it. Now, Joanne, did they grow flax here? Yes, once upon a time they did. Oh my! And of course, cotton, and mm -hmm. then. Um, wool, wool. From the sheep. so those would have been our three mm -hmm. choices of fabric. Right. And did we do anything with dyeing? Oh yes, we. We'll show you that later at the Lewis House at the 1840s. Okay. You went out in the woods and you decided what color you'd like, and then you use that. And in spring of each year, May 19th was our opening day. We have an annual dye day. We're dyeing oh. the thread. And so if people came on that day, mm -hmm. May 19th. Well, whatever the. Whatever day. The Saturday nearest May 15th. Okay. That's our opening day. How wonderful. And so people in the yes. public from Clarksville oh, yes. or wherever can come here and you show them how to do it? Yes. And other activities also. Here are the original reeds. We have a reproduction reed, but if you can imagine, these, this is an original reed, reed that came from Okay, so you said there was some kind of um, tool that helps you push the Yes, thread. you have a little instrument that you pull it through with. This is incredible how close together those are. It's what see, work this uh, was. And here's another ha hatchel. It's very dirty. This is where you get the seed out of the cotton. Okay. 
and that, of course, was an enormous yes. project in That's itself. Once upon a time, they did that by hand, by hand. before they... Incredible. So, um, you know, when we said that women's work was never done, we weren't kidding, were we? We really weren't kidding. Th this That's is true. an undertaking. This is incredible work. So we've seen the smokehouse and the loom, and I think you said there was one other. We have place. a blacksmith shop. Oh, let's uh -huh. let's look at that. Okay. Now it's All time right. for the men to work. Yes. We are standing in front of the blacksmith shop. Yes. And you were just starting to tell me about this. I guess this would be a, a major piece. This of is a grinding wheel. This is how you kept everything sharp. And you did this with your feet. Yes. And the marvelous thing is that we still have the little cup, the tin cup that holds the water to cool the wheel off when it gets too hot. So you would be grinding, moving that with your feet. Did they sit here? Well, probably, but it would be a bit rough. Yeah. You could, a man could. I'm just trying to figure out uh -huh. how, because you'd have to. They'd have and to sit. So they did their sharpening here and poured the water on mm -hmm. it when it got too hot. Wow. And so this is the blacksmith shop where they made and sharpened everything. Yes. Um, so what kinds of things? I mean, I see all, all right. this really heavy. Before we go in, I'd like to point this out. This is a wagon jack. You've seen uh, the TV programs that show where the wheels come off of the wagons. Yes. And you wonder how in the world did they change the tire or the wheel yeah, on the, the wagon? Tire. Yeah. Well, this is a wagon jack. It sits on the ground and you jack the oh. wagon up. I'll be. And it's made of wood. It's ma everything. Now was that's made. incredible. To I mean, who would have just? It makes sense, but you never would have thought. The blacksmith of that. did this, of course, the metal. Ah, okay, the pieces. Tell us, do you know anything about any of these other? I mean, that's sort of an unusual. This is an ox yoke. This is one of the largest ox yokes you've ever seen. Those of you familiar with oxen, there would be a pair, and this hook would go around their neck mm -hmm. in order to keep them together and to do your work. To pull. So you've heard stout as an oxen. Well, that's big. That meant. Yeah. And so these other pieces, obviously, there's some pulleys. Uh -huh. Now, would the blacksmith have made these? Or? Initially, very early, yes. Okay. He had to make them. There was no other way. If we'll get a shot of the inside, you can see the anvil. I see. This is and huge. And you see the equipment where he turns the blower. The blower keeps the fire going. Ah. So he makes the horseshoes, he makes all the metal. And so this, this small fireplace was really a very hot yes, fireplace. for that he, him. And that's, these other pieces? That's the blower. Okay. It blows the air. You turn the wheel and the air keeps the fire going. Okay. Just as you have trouble with your fireplace. Like a, like really like a bellows. Yes, it, it's, it it's a bellows, that's right. Okay, and, and then this piece right here? That's a stitching horse. You, If you're trying to work on a saddle, for example, it's very difficult to hold it and work, oh, use your okay. hands. So this would hold your saddle or anything else that it would attach to. Mm -hmm. It would tighten up and you could sit and work on it. Uh -huh. Mend it, fix it. And so all these other pieces in here, they, they all look like they have something to do with, with a yoke or a saddle. Or um, a horse or yeah. a buggy. Tell him about the um, ones in the left-hand corner there. Well, you have a vice. You have parts of a wagon. You have the yoke for the horses. You have just a myriad of things the blacksmith might be waiting to work on. Or uh, he might have to do some leather work in order to uh, attach whatever he needed. So it's a well-equipped shop. It's used quite a bit. And this was located originally? At the end of Weekly Road. Okay, so on, this was on your property? On my husband's. It was his grandfather's and his great-grandfather's. And so Glenn was here. You said his father, his grandfather. So Glenn Weekly's family was just really from here. Well, we're a century farm, and this that we call historic Collinsville. We took about 40 acres of our pasture land mm -hmm. and developed it into this settlement. But our land goes from here to the river, the Cumberland River. And his grandfather and uncle came in here in the late 1800s and bought the land and developed it and worked with horses and mules and lived in the house at the end of the road, which is where we lived for the first eight years when we married. So uh, wow. it's a century farm and it's still being used for cattle, tobacco, corn, soybeans.
I wanted to be sure that we had an opportunity to really look at some of the toys that children played with. And I think it's unique, this collection that Joan Ann has. And, you know, remember that space was so important. I mean, it was very limited what they could take with them. So show us these priceless possessions here. All right. Well, in order to teach a child, you have to get their interest. And in order to get their interest, it has to be something interesting. So most of them know their ancestors came across the mountains in a buggy or a wagon. And they didn't have much to bring. And certainly this would have been for the children only. This little box is covered with wallpaper and it's fairly ancient also. But the boys and the girls would have shared the little box and everything would have been handmade except for this. This kind of interests the little girls. We asked them, what is that? Oh, those are scissors. Well, no, actually they have to do with your hair. They're curling irons. You place it on the fireplace or the hearth. It gets real warm and then you curl your hair. And then little boys like to have things of their own. So they have their own cup. Someone made for them. This is made of horn. It's a very fine cup, unlike the one in the kitchen. I'll say, what is this made of? Plastic? No, it isn't plastic. It's from, actual natural it's horn. It's from a horn. Little girls would have made their dolls out of corn shucks. This was made here. We also have Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy. And this is, is the cutest thing, Miss Piggy. Is, she's a little pig made out of a corn cob with corn shucks for ears. She's minus a leg right now. She's hobbling. And hobby. a little corkscrew tail. Uh, if that isn't the cutest thing. But when we have our Colonial Pioneer Christmas, we have Christmas trees in each room. And uh, the first Christmas at Colonial Williamsburg, the trees were filled with, with pigs. Very clever. I mean, just anything that they had, they made into That's something. That's right. And I'd like to see that corn shuck doll again. That's a, she's a good girl. Oh, there. look at how beautiful she is. Now, this was not easy to do. No, it's very difficult. We've had workshops, and we found that children really have a difficult time trying to work uh, this, the shucks. This is incredible workmanship to create this. And then I think you had something else. Yes. The... Piece de resistance we, we're coming <laughs> with. Well, uh, of course, we we have the little sheep. I think I failed to show the little sheep to oh. you. Here's the white sheep. And uh, <laughs> somewhere we have its counterpart. Let's see if we can't find Our the black. counterpart to the sheep. Yes, we have the black sheep of the family. Oh, my goodness. And now, they are, are these are wool? Yes, you so just take actually wool. From a, oh. And you just... Uh, some say, well, that looks more like a dog, and actually it does. It kind of looks like a schnauzer, It could be whatever you want it to be. That's <laughs> the wonderful thing about making something yourself. Well, and children's imagination can make this into anything. So. The and then I think you had one more piece. You told me that. Uh, the, my in, favorite. All right. The mouse. <laughs> little boys have tortured little girls with mice forever. And here is one made of corn shucks. If that isn't the cutest thing. So these were the toys that would have enchanted children as they traveled and arrived yes. in a place that had a lot of hard work ahead. A lot of hard work. And one other thing I'd like to show you would be something we just acquired. And by the way, you'll notice some of the toys are iron. I did notice that. Iron was just becoming the thing. and. Uh, they have some wonderful iron horses, fire engine. This is a nativity scene. Oh my, a corn, a corn shuck nativity scene. Look at how intricate. We can see the, the Magi. Uh-huh, and oh, you see baby we Jesus. See Joseph and Mary, Mary and the baby Jesus. Oh my goodness sakes. And I think we have a couple of angels here. This is beautiful. This tries to teach them that they can do something themselves. They can make these things. Wow. And I think we have enough time. I wanted you to show us, you kind of mentioned about the soap, about making oh, soap. Oh, yes, we make we soap. we take a look. So this is, what you had a special An name? ash hopper. Ash hopper. Hopper, yes. Okay. And what would happen is you would clean out your fireplace, place your ashes in here, and you would have a some uh, barrel or, or some container down mm -hmm, here to mm -hmm. catch after when it rains and the 
lie leaches out of the ashes, you would catch that, and that's the lie you would use to make your lye soap with. Now, when when you say lye, I don't really, I'm, I'm not visioning what we're talking about. Are we talking about a liquid? It's a liquid. Okay. It's a liquid. And it, what color is it? Well, it depends on your wood somewhat. So what color, whatever kind of it's, wood? It's uh, sort of a reddish to clear, to clear to reddish color, and you have to have some fat. You take your beef fat after you kill your beef, mm -hmm. which is the best, and you boil that, and you have your lye in there, and it takes a, you have one string, and you have to dip that string about 50 to 60 dips to make one candle. Wow. For it to coat. Okay, one at a you time. You take a string from your 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 loom or mm -hmm. your spinning wheel. And so that's how you made candles. But didn't we also do lye soap? Yes, you do lye soap the same way. You just cook it and you pour it up in cardboard and you let it soak uh, age for about six weeks because the lye will leach out and then it will be as softer than anything you buy at the market plus better for you, no preservatives. Okay. Just has the good so old grease in it. Candles and soap. light soap made from the same product but treated a little bit differently. Yes. Well, we kind of come back to practical, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need, for lye soap, you need, uh, well, for the candles, you need some beeswax, too, mm -hmm. out of the, from the bees. That well, is this is a marvelous little chicken house where the chickens were kept. We have walking trails. We have marvelous walking trails down in the woods. This is so beautiful, and today is such a gorgeous day. I wanted to be sure, well, let's just real quick tell us about that this, enormous uh, tub over here. Uh, and then we're going to tell everybody how they can come and visit you here at, at historic Collinsville. This tub was used for anything it needed to be used for. It could be used for washing clothes. Uh, it could be used for hogs. It was bought by Eldon Buckner at a sale many, many years ago. And his this wife donated it to Collinsville after he passed away, and we're so thankful for it and proud to have it. And so this was multi-use. I wonder how this got here. Do we have any idea? Well, of the age with of a it? lot of difficulty. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but originally, how how old do you think? Oh, this is? it might have been made at Cumberland Furnace. You know, that's ore. I mean, it's made mm -hmm. from iron, and we did have the top made because if you leave the water in there, it will split. You know, uh -huh. it could burst. Yeah. It could During ruin the winter. It. Well, I wanted to be sure that everyone knew how to get out here. I mean, this is a glorious place, and uh, Joanne and Glenn Weekly have worked so hard to make this an attraction. It's a great place to take your family, to learn history, to walk. Like you said, you've got the walking trails, trails. and s just so many buildings here. But Joanne, tell us again the phone number and how the days and times okay. you're open. All right, well, we have a website. It's uh, www.historiccollinsville.com. It has information and good directions. We're open May 15th through October 15th, Thursday through Sunday for self-guided tours and other days for guided tours by reservation. The phone number is 931-648-9141, and we really would like for you to come. I think you'll enjoy it, and uh, we thank you for coming today. It is our history, it's our heritage, and you will find it right here in Clarksville at Historic Collinsville, which is located in Southside. Yeah. And I think you gave real good uh, well, communication on how to call you, and you have a website, and it's easy to get here. We're about 12 miles south of Clarksville, and if you'll take Highway 48 and 13 south, there are four signs that lead you to the site. So don't so turn if you don't see a sign. It's easy to get to. It's easy to get to. It's our history and our heritage.
Have you ever been hungry, worried about where you're going to get your next meal? Loaves and Fishes is an organization feeding the hungry. Primarily through volunteer efforts and donations, we are able to accomplish this mission. Loaves and Fishes provides a midday meal Monday through Saturday year-round. We provide food to agencies helping the needy through our distribution program. If you would like to donate, get involved, or for more information, you can find us on the web at www.loavesandfishestn.org. Please help us with our mission of feeding the hungry.